Hello again, and thank you for watching again. Uh, today I want to talk about prayer. More specifically, the Lord's Prayer. When we pray, that's our direct communication with God. That's how our relationship grows. We express our wants, our needs, our desires, everything that we're going through, we take it to God. We talk to Him. Our relationship grows through this. And today I want to talk about the Lord's Prayer, the example that Jesus gave to us. This message is titled, Pray Then in This Way. I'm reading out of Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. It says, Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. Do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive others of their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive you of your offenses. Heavenly Father, I just come to you thankful for your word, thankful for the example that Jesus gave us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we dig into these verses, Lord, you just fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us a clear understanding of your desire for us to communicate with you and what these verses mean. In Jesus' name. So I'm going to break this down. We're going to go through it verse by verse. I got a little bit nerdy, looked up some words, and, and I'd like to share what, what I found and revisit this ver these verses with a little better, clearer understanding. So starting in verse 9, it says, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. When we start our prayer by acknowledging God as our Father, it reminds us of our position with Him, our relation to Him. He is our loving Father. We are His precious children. If we keep this awareness first in our minds, it puts us in a position to receive. It puts us in a position to come to him like a son comes to a father you know I can I can always tell when my son wants something by the way he starts the conversation I could be in the other room and he'll walk in and you know his, his voice will be kind of sweet and he'll say something like hey dad and I, I recognize that but recognizing how he addressed me and the way he came to me it puts me in a position to hear his request and to act on it. And it usually works. It usually works when he comes up to me and, and he's got that you know, sweet little voice. Hey, Dad, you know, I, I'm really receptive to what he has to say. And the way he acknowledges me as, as Dad and, and just comes to me sincerely, you know, it opens me up to hear what he has to say. So I think by opening up our prayer, acknowledging God as our loving Father, kind of opens him up to hear what we have to say. We're stepping into that position with him, coming to him as loved children. But immediately, this verse goes from acknowledging that intimate relationship that we have with Him into exclaiming His holiness and His position. It says, who is in heaven? This reminds us of where our Father is at. This reminds us of His holiness. The love that God has for us is connected always connected to His holiness. 
They both are always present. So yes, He is our loving Father, and we can come to Him like a child comes to His Father. But He is holy. When we say our Father in heaven, we are claiming the power that our Father has. Often in human relationships, we experience hurt and disappointment, dishonesty. But by putting these words together, when we address God as our Father who is in heaven, we are exclaiming that God's love and His power are inseparable. His love for us and His power are inseparable. God is love. His will for our lives is motivated by love. The power that comes from His love for us is unchanging, unstoppable, never failing. Our Father who is in heaven, we're claiming our relationship to Him and we're expressing His holiness, His position, His power. Our Father who is in heaven. The second part, hallowed be your name or let your name be held holy. Hallowed, when translated from Greek, is a combination of a verb and an adjective. Two parts, one showing action and the other describing it. The Greek translation for, for holy is hagios. And it literally means different or separated from all other things. So by saying, hallowed be your name, we are saying, let God's name be treated differently than any other name, held to a higher regard than any other name, in a position that is absolutely separate and unique, higher regard than anything else. I found that in, in the Hebrew language, the word for name is more than just what a person is called. My name is Aaron, but that's not who I am. That's my title, my name, it's what I go by. But in Hebrew, it has a deeper connection, a deeper meaning than just somebody's title. In Hebrew, it describes the character, the very nature of that person, the personality of that person. So when we're saying, hallowed be your name, we're saying, God, you are holy. You are holy. Not, not just his name. An example is Psalms 9:10. It says, those who hold thy name, who know thy name, excuse me, those who know thy name put their trust in thee. You know, the psalmist wasn't saying that those who know that Jehovah is God's name all of a sudden have the ability to trust him. No, he's saying that those who know God's unchanging character, his unconditional love, his compassion, those people who know that know that they can trust him. They know that the God that they serve is trustworthy. In these verses in Matthew, Jesus is saying, remember when we pray that we are talking to a Father who loves us unconditionally. We're talking to a person who has all the power and authority in heaven and on earth. And we're talking to a Father who deserves all our respect, our adoration. When we start each conversation with God, with this mindset in our hearts, the mindset in your heart, it puts us in a position of giving our love and adoration to God. And it puts us in a position to receive all the blessings that He wants to bestow upon us. Saying this with a with clearer understanding of, of 
what the what these words mean could sound something like this my loving father who sits on the throne of heaven your unfailing power comes from your love for me i lift you up above everything else praising you and worshiping you for who you are you are holy and i cherish you now verse 10 says your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven when you study the bible it's important to pay attention to punctuation pay attention to capital letters pay attention to commas periods these things help us understand more clearly what the author was trying to say a few examples are, are the capital L in Isaiah 43 15 God said I am the Lord your God L O R D all in capital letters that's talking about Lord God Father the Father anytime you read your Bible and you see the Lord in L-O-R-D, all capital letters, you know that the author was talking about God the Father. And Jesus, when he referred to him, uh, Paul asked Jesus, Who are you, Lord? Capital L, lowercase O-R-D. I am Jesus, the Nazarene. So Lord, with the capital L and little O-R-D, Speaking about Jesus. We keep these in mind while we're reading. It helps us understand which part of, of God they're talking about. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Capital L. I am the light of the world. Those are just a few examples. But keeping punctuation in mind when you study the word. If we look at this verse, your kingdom come, period. That's the complete request. You know, the, the second part of this verse goes with the first part. It, it expresses the first part. And often Hebrew authors would use this form of writing. This is called parallelism, where the second part expounds on the first part. An example of this is, is Psalms 46.1. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The second part of that verse expounds the first part. So looking at, at, at verse 10 here, it says, your kingdom come, period. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's saying this is what it looks like when, when your kingdom comes. Your will will be done just like it is in heaven will be done here. When we start talking about the kingdom of, of heaven, many questions can come to mind. You know, are we asking for the physical place of heaven to come? Or are we asking that right now be as it is in heaven? The kingdom of God is, is not so much as dealing with governments and nations and, and stuff like that. It's not a kingdom like that. The kingdom of God deals more with the individual, with each personal relationship. It has everything to do with an individual person on a personal level. To be in the kingdom of God is to be in the will of God. In Luke 17, 20 through 21, Jesus says that the kingdom of God is in our midst. Jesus is, is asking us, asking that God will enable us to be obedient to his will. The kingdom of heaven, everything is done according to his will. It's perfect. When we ask, let your kingdom come, we're asking God, enable me to live according to your will. 
Just as everything is done according to your will in heaven, give me the ability to live according to your will now. But it takes each one of us to make a personal decision and submission to God. To request your kingdom come and let it be fulfilled in your life. Remember, we serve a loving and compassionate God. His will for our lives is to love. His commandment that he gives to us under the new covenant is to love. When we keep that in mind, how hard can it be to submit to his will? If his will is love, love me, love your neighbors, love each other, how hard is that to submit to that will? If we can submit to, the, to God's command of love each other, we'll see his kingdom come and his will be done. So verse 10 rephrased this. I wrote it like this. Father, enable me to be obedient to your will. Let my life be perfectly complete in your love. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Now, people have multiple ways of, of interpreting and applying scripture. I found three different interpretations of this and I think they're all good, all three of them. They're all different, but I think they're all good. The first one I found is that this could be interpreted as spiritual food. Give us today our spiritual food. This verse could be a request to God for his true teaching, his true doctrine, which can only be found by reading the Bible. Food for the soul. Give us today our daily bread. There's a, a devotional called the daily bread. The second one that, that I came across was the bread could stand for Jesus himself. In John 6, 35 through 33, Jesus called himself the bread of life. Jesus said that he alone can satisfy us and in him alone we will find all that will sustain us. So this verse could be a request to teach us to look to Jesus for fulfillment for today. And then the third, probably the most simplest interpretation is that this is simply a prayer that God will supply us with the things that we need for today. Like I said, I think all three interpretations are good. Uh, we absolutely need the Word of God. We absolutely need Jesus to sustain us. And we absolutely need what we need for the day. In Him, everything is made complete. So I think this verse is showing us just to put our trust in God. Even in the simplest things like, what are we going to eat today? Now, God cares about our physical bodies. He cares about our well-being, our health. And I think that's why He created us to be able to work and think and, and provide for ourselves. Praying for our daily bread teaches us to trust God for today's provisions but I think it can go deeper. I think it can also remind us that all of our abilities, our talents, everything that we're capable of comes from Him anyway. Depending on Him for your abilities. Depending on Him for your talents. Even the abilities and the talents that you've developed over time, like uh, Stephen Curry getting good at, at three point. That's a God-given ability. But Stephen Curry applied himself. God gave him the, the ability to build that. God designed us to be able to work and create and care for ourselves. Asking for our daily bread could be asking for an opportunity to work. Asking for an opportunity to use the ability that God has given you to provide for yourself. Looking at this verse like that, I, I took a second and I looked at my hands. And I just said, thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord, for these hands. They're perfect for doing what you created them to do. Give me the opportunity, Lord, to use these hands to provide for myself. Give me today my daily bread. Give me the ability to work and provide for my family and to bless others with these hands. Thank you, Father, for helping me to remember to depend completely on you. Verse 12, it says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This, this is the part that gets kind of deep. This verse, verse 12, comes with two sub-verses. Verses 14 and 15, I'm going to read them again. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive you of your offenses. The first part, the request for our own forgiveness. I think it's important that we all admit that we need forgiveness. We need divine forgiveness. And that only comes from Jesus Christ. We all need God's grace. But we need to accept it. We need to live in it. We need to move in it. We need to acknowledge the power of His grace. It's not just for saving us. It's for making it moment by moment by moment. I think it's important that we, rem that we remember exactly what it cost God to give us this forgiveness. We need to remember all that Jesus had to endure so we could be forgiven. It's important to learn to walk in the freedom of your forgiveness. Don't be held down by your, by your shame. Don't be held down by, by yesterday's mistakes. Accept God's grace. As we forgive others, forgive us our debts. There's freedom in forgiveness. Not just the forgiveness that we receive from God, but the forgiveness that we give to our brothers and sisters. There's freedom in forgiving people. We've been set free from the power of sin. The, the, the word says, you are now free from sin. It doesn't say free to sin. We're still, we still need to stop sinning. Jesus' message was go and sin no more. But we have His grace. We have the ability to start from perfection and continue in it. I think... The more that we have it in our mind of what we've been forgiven of, the extent that Jesus went to to forgive us, it might be a little bit easier to forgive somebody else when they do us wrong. Just remember, Jesus gave his life to forgive their sins as well. When they're holding something against you or you're holding something against them, you're only hurting each other. You're only hurting yourself. When you can remember all that you've been forgiven of, it's easier to extend forgiveness to the other person. When the forgiveness that you have received from God is the foundation on which you forgive others, it enables us to kind of put it back on God. God, you forgave me, help me forgive them. I have a friend, a real close friend, who he hated some people in his life for some stuff that they had done. And he hated them with a the passion. He's a, he's a believer in Christ. He's kind of a spiritual mentor to me. But for a long period of his life, he could not forgive these people. And he got down to a point where, where he just cried out to God. Lord, you want me to forgive them? I can't do it. You're going to have to do it, God. I give it to you. 
and, and he, he, as he tells this story, the Holy Spirit comes upon him and he just starts saying, in the name of Jesus, I forgive this person. In the name of Jesus, I forgive that person. In the name of Jesus, and he continued to proclaim it. In the name of Jesus, I forgive them. So when you feel like there's, there's a person in your life or a situation in your life that you can't forgive, get to the point where you can give it to Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I can't do this, Lord. I need you to step in and just proclaim it. I forgive this person in Jesus' name. There's power when you speak the name of Jesus. Forgiveness is a choice, but it's not optional. A lot of the time we feel so much pain and anger and, and sorrow and grief that we, we don't think we can forgive that person. But it's times like this that we need to cry out to the Holy Spirit. Remember, the same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that is alive and living in you. It's only by giving God complete control over your feelings and emotions that you can start to forgive. It's not by your ability or by your power. It's by the power of Christ inside of you. I think Jesus was pretty point blank when, when he ended this with that. For if you forgive others of your sins, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. We must forgive. Going back up to verse 13, it says, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Today the word temptation, I think, is, is almost always associated with a negative viewing, with negative things. And just rightfully so. You know, I think, I think it'd be a, a big improvement on our mindset if we could stop viewing temptation as negative, as something that will make you fall, and start viewing it as another opportunity to overcome Satan, another opportunity to choose God instead of selfish desires. With the mindset, with that kind of mindset, and this is, this is kind of a, a weird way of looking at it, I think. But if we could get that mindset, anytime you get temp tempted to do something, temptation comes. Have it in your mind, not as, oh, I'm being tempted to fall. I'm being tempted to lust. I'm being tempted to get high. No, view it as, this is an opportunity for me to serve the Lord. This is an opportunity for me to honor my wife. This is an opportunity for me to continue in the things that God is establishing in me. Temptation is not designed to make us into sinners. It's meant to make us aware of the necessity of Jesus Christ. Temptation is a test of loyalty and obedience. In Matthew 4, 1, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. God will allow us to be tested, but God does not tempt us to do evil. When temptations come, we're, we're faced with a choice. Are we going to depend on Him or ourselves? Are we going to give in or are we going to stand firm in the faith that we have? God wants us to overcome temptation. God wants us to be victorious. And He knows that we can. But we must learn to be dependent on Him, on His strength. Jesus goes on in Matthew 4 and He shuts down every temptation that Satan threw at Him. He shuts Him down with Scripture. So if you want to be able to fight temptation, you want to be able to, to resist when an urge comes? Study scripture. Memorize some verses. 
a cuss word pops into your, your head, remember Ephesians 4.29. Instill in your mind the Word of God. Jesus used it, and every time Satan came at him, Jesus quoted Scripture. If we quote Scripture every time we get tempted, we'll be fighting Satan in the same way that Jesus did. Studying Scripture is building your spiritual strength and your stamina to stand against anything that might come against you, whether it's your own personal desire, your flesh, or whether it's some kind of trick that, that Satan's throwing at you, whatever it is, scripture is the answer for temptation. Jesus is our defense against temptation. The word of God is our defense against Satan. So by asking the, our Father to lead us not into temptation, we're really asking God to enable us to depend on Him. To depend on the power of Jesus Christ living inside of us. It's putting our faith and complete trust in Jesus that we will have the victory. When we can learn to live in the power and the freedom that belong to Christ, we can start to live in an abundant life Jesus gave us this example of how to pray. An example of who to depend on and a mindset that will enable us to live in an abundant life. Our communication with God is the most important and vital part of your relationship with Him. Pray, talk to Him continually. Invite Him into every aspect of your life while you're watering the, the trees, while you're cooking dinner or washing the dishes or whatever you're doing. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. I don't like doing this, God, but thank you that I have dishes to wash. You got a pile of laundry? Lord, help me get through this. But do it and talk to him. He loves to hear your voice. He created it. Spend time praying to your Father who loves you. Talk to the Father that loves you. Talk to the Son who saved you. And cry out to the Holy Spirit who transforms you. Praise Him. Thank Him. Worship Him. After breaking these verses down and, and studying them like this, I rewrote this prayer. And this is, this is just my understanding, my version of it. I encourage everybody to take these and this prayer that Jesus wrote, these notes that, that we've gone over today, and make them your own. Make them your own, make them personal. Talk to Him. This is the way I rewrote this. Our loving Father who sits on the throne of heaven, your unfailing power is motivated by your love for us. We lift you up above everything else, praising and worshiping you because you are holy and we cherish you for who you are. God, enable us to live obediently according to your desire for our lives. Let our lives be perfectly complete in your love. Not only us, but all of creation, living according to your will. Help us, Father, to depend on you. We know that our needs will be met because of your love for us, God. Thank you for giving us the ability to work and provide. Thank you for our abilities and our talents. Give us the opportunity to serve you and to bless others. Please forgive us and create in us the love of Christ so we can forgive others. And by that same power living inside of us, enable us to stand against any temptation of our flesh or tricks of, of the devil. 
Help us to bring our flesh into subjection to your will. Lord, let our lives be the proof of your love so that we can bring you all the glory and honor that you deserve. In the precious name of Jesus, my Savior, amen. Prayer, communication with God. There's nothing better, nothing more fulfilling. Sometimes I like to, to open to like Colossians or Ephesians or some of, some of the, the New Testaments where the authors would say prayers, pray for the church, pray for your family, pray for this, and I make them personal. I change the words just a little bit, but I read it and I make it personal. I encourage everybody watching, make it personal. Talk to the Father. He loves you. Father God, I love you, Lord. I thank you for your love. I thank you for the example that Jesus gave us here, Lord. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will just help us to be mindful of who you are. Be mindful of your love for us, Lord God. I pray, Heavenly Father, that every person that, that sees this, listens to this message, Lord, will deepen and strengthen their communication with you, Lord God. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.